So um, our, our second speaker for today will be uh, Professor um, Sharon Hassin. She's the director of the Institute for Movement Disorders at the Shiba Medical Center and head of the Neurology and Neurosurgery Department at Tel Aviv University. Um, she also teaches some of the most popular courses in the physical therapy department with us. Um, and she's performed, uh, we have also do some research studies together, it's always a pleasure to, to work together. And she's performed lots of research on many, many different types of uh, movement disorders, um, the, especially on uh, Parkinson's disease. So today she's going to talk about why Parkinson's patients slow. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me to this amazing uh, conference, which is so different from ours, yeah? Okay, so I'm really a clinician, and we're going to talk about this problem of being slow, which is the main complaint of patients and their family members, the people surrounding them, that the patients are so slow, that they do everything so slow, much slower than they used to, they have to prepare for more time uh, in the morning. I mean, it takes them more time to prepare until they get to work. They do less at work, then they come back at home. They do less uh, course because everything takes uh, so long, even eating, of course, preparing a meal, but even eating, the eating is slower. And, and everybody has to wait for them and to pace slower in order to walk next to them. And even it seems that they perhaps react or answer slowly or think slower. And, and even they tell us that when they have to move their affected hand, because Parkinson's many times is asymmetrical, and they have to do something with that hand, they have to concentrate on, on giving on, on the execution of the task. And that takes them, they feel that like it takes them more time. And, and if they have to do multiple tasks, two tasks at the same time, they even get slower. And, and the slowness is really the problem that makes them, that gives them eventually uh, most of the disability until a state where they cannot perform uh, several tasks and uh, activities. And this movement abnormality affects their facial muscles and they smile less and they have, may have a masked face and their speech is quieter. And, and sometimes hard to understand. And these are the complaints that we hear from patients and for them, from their environment. And just going back to what is Parkinson's disease, so it's a degenerative disease of the brain, and with the clinical manifestations, we divide them today. It's very uh, like dichotomic to motor features and non-motor features. I will not talk today about the very diverse and multiple uh, non-motor features dealing with cognition, emotion, uh, behavior, autonomic functioning, pain, sleep, okay? But these things also have an effect on the motor. You can imagine on the motor um, um, uh, function of the patients. And I will focus today on the motor problems. And here we are dealing with a syndrome which is called Parkinsonism, a motor syndrome. And it has these main uh, features, which are bradykinesia, the topic of our talk, rigidity, tremor, gait, and postural impairment. And as our patients are treated with very effective dopamine replacement therapy, since the basis of this Parkinsonism is a dopaminergic deficit in the striatum, okay? So they develop also motor symptoms which are related to the therapy, the L-DOPA therapy, the dopamine replacement therapy, causes other movement disorder to these bradykinetic people, such as involuntary movements called dyskinesias, and fluctuating motor condition during the day with the medications. So, but today we are going to focus on the uh, bradykinesia, which is the, is the most important component or, or um, constituent of the Parkinsonian syndrome. So the whole Parkinsonism is really closely associated with the degeneration of these nigros striatal pathways. Uh, one of the pathologies of the Parkinson's brain is the degeneration, the death of dopamine-producing cells in the substantia nigra pars compacta in the midbrain, and these cells uh, go directly to the striatum and uh, innervate it with the dopamine, which then um, uh, has effect on, of course, cortical uh, areas through the thalamus, 
And when this uh, pathway is degenerated, we have the Parkinsonian syndrome, and we can improve it by providing the brain either dopamine or dopamine replacements such as agonists in order to reconstitute the dopaminergic innervation to the brain and improving, thus improving the motor system. And we can see the dopaminergic deficit in these pathways with uh, isotopic scans, with dopamine transporters, and we can see that here this Parkinson's brain has less tracer uptake, which represents the degeneration of this pathway, okay? So, and just going back a little bit more, all of this problem with the dopamine is related to a neurodegenerative process, which is associated with deposits of alpha-synuclein in the brain, and we know that this doesn't start in the midbrain in the substantia nigra. It starts in other places like the lower brainstem or factory bulb. So we have a lot of non-motor features coming before the, the motor Parkinsonian syndrome, and that's and eventually uh, also involving the whole brain, cortical areas. So Parkinson's disease actually is a total brain or multiple uh, fo multifocal brain disorder, and that's why we have so many motor and non-motor features, okay? And the evolution of these symptoms usually begins with a non-motor, and then at, we diagnose the patients only when they start having the, the Parkinsonian uh, problems because depression and, and hyposmia are not specific enough, but when they appear with a tremor, with the bradykinesia, we diagnose this disease. And of course, the whole Parkinsonian syndrome worsens with time, with years, as well as uh, the diversity and the impact of the non-motor features. So this is the life of a Parkinsonian patient. Before he's diagnosed, he has non-motor symptoms. And through his whole life since the diagnosis, his motor and non-motor features uh, worsen until his death. Okay, so we're talking now about uh, impairment. We talked about the Parkinsonian syndrome um, uh, and we're gonna talk mostly on the Parkinsonian syndrome, but disability and impaired quality of life in Parkinson's patients is correlated with several non-motor symptoms. And if we talk about the motor symptoms, those that have the strongest correlation with disability are bradykinesia, gait impairment, and postural instability, okay? And uh, so bradykinesia, who, when did that word come from? So is it James Parkinson's? Uh, 200 years ago in his, ass, in his essay on the shaking palsy, did he make this observation that the patients were slow? Not really. Actually, he thought that they had lessened muscular power and even called the disease palsy, paralysis, okay? And, but he did see that the hand was failing to answer with exactness to the dictates of will, and that the legs is, is also suffer, suffers fatigue uh, sooner than the, the non-affected leg, and that the legs are not raised high enough when the patients are walking. And actually, 100 years later, the term bradykinesia was, was proposed, not in the context of, of Parkinson's. And then we have, uh, when we when we, we, we adopted this term for Parkinson's, and actually it's used mainly in Parkinsonian syndrome, and we're talking about a slowness of movement, which is very, very general, okay? It applies to both voluntary movements and automatic or spontaneous movements, and it applies to the beginning of the movement and to slowing during the whole execution of voluntary movements, and, and eventually we saw that we have mainly low amplitude, amplitude movements, which are called hypokinesia, and states of no movement, inability to perform a movement while the rest of the motor system is intact, which we call akinesia. And eventually, <coughs> the current definition became slowness of movement, but a very important um, uh, process was described, a progressive reduction in movement amplitude and velocity when performing repetitive movements. And this was termed the sequence effect, and it has become very important in the um, uh, recognition of bradykinesia. And we can see that repetitive movements in a normal person, it, can, it does not uh, reduce the pace or the amplitude, and with Parkinsonism, uh, there is mild and in severe cases more 
um, decrement in the amplitude here in, uh, that we can see. And the core feature of Parkinsonism actually is the bradykinesia, okay? In order to diagnose that a patient has Parkinsonism, we have to see that he has bradykinesia, which is slowness with the decrement, with the, with the, the sequence effect. And it has to be combined with either, at least one of, rigidity or rest tremor. Only then we can say that a patient has Parkinsonism. And then we have to see if it is really Parkinson's disease, because many conditions may cause Parkinsonism. And when we talk about bradykinesia, we also have to say where. Where does it affect the person? And we know that everywhere that there are uh, uh, skeletal muscles, we can have bradykinesia, and we do in the Parkinson's patient. It may start on one side, but eventually it involves many uh, or almost all of the, the uh, musculature. So we have facial bradykinesia and a, a condition that we called hypomemia, that's poverty and or lack of amemia, lack of uh, use of facial expressions. We have a lot of involvement of the oropharyngeal uh, system with slowing and with reduced swallowing frequency and with a uh, problem with articulation, which we call hypokinetic dysarthria. We have lowered volume of speech, which we call hypophonia. We have, of course, involvement of the hands and fingers that cause fine motor difficulties and the micrographia, the small handwriting of Parkinson's patients, which is so typical. And we have the whole of the axial movements, how to uh, roll in bed, how to get out of bed, how to get to rise from a chair, okay? How to get into the car, the axial movement, the trunkal movements, and uh, they're affected. And of course, the mostly we use our feet and legs for walking and uh, standing and walking, so we have a variety of gait disturbances uh, with small paces and, and low clearance and freezing that we talked about just a few minutes. So, and how do us clinicians, how do we, how do we, how do we uh, um, detect and quantify? We use scales, okay? We use clinical scales in which we ask questions about motor and non-motor function, and we also examine the patients and we quantify their movement disorder. And actually, we look at the body as the, the midline structures and the limbs, and we have the, the sides, of course, right and left. So when we, when we check the limbs, we check for tremor, rigidity, and of course, bradykinesia in the right and left upper and lower limbs. And we quantify the bradykinesia by assessing finger taps and hand movements and more proximal movements and similarly the lower limbs. And, uh, and of course, we assess the, all the midline structures, facial expression, speech, rising, posture, standing, stability, walking, okay? And we give them scores and then we add them up and we have a motor score for the Parkinsonism. But we can look at the bradykinesia alone, okay? And that's what we do in, in the, the clinic. We, we check for all of these movements, and we can also do the a walking test, timed. And of course, there's a lot of technologies and sensors that can, can assess activity and can assess bradykinesia, and I'm not getting into that uh, because this is more for research. Perhaps it will go into the clinical uh, state. So, so Actually, a bradykinesia was a mixture of things that composed the slowness of movement. But recently, the people from the Movement Disorder Society decided to dissect this bradykinesia complex and to redefine the terminology. And, and, and actually, we are talking now about the bradykinesia uh, in, in two different conditions, in the voluntary movements and in the automatic movements. What is automatic movements? Just like moving as I'm speaking, using my facial expression, swinging my arms when I'm walking, breathing, okay? All kinds of activities that are automatic and I'm not aware of. And uh, we call oligo, this is, this is a new term, oligokinesia, which refers to reduction in automatic or spontaneous movements, okay? And this is one feature. And then we have the bradykinesia, which specifically refers to the slowness of voluntary movements, either a continuous or a repetitive movements. And then we have to say, do we have, uh, um, do we have the sequence effect, the decrement of movement? Do we have hesitation and halts? Okay, 
And is there an akinesia, an inability to perform? And of course, when we, when we describe these features in the body, in the movements of the Parkinsonian patients, we have to say, where does this affect the patient? The right side, Parkinson's is very commonly begins unilaterally and usually remains asymmetrical during many, many years. Okay, so we say which side is worse and is it, the, is it also midline structures, etc. So this is how we define nowadays the, the bradykinesia and here are several examples of, uh, of, these, um, of these new terms that I, that I just explained. So, what are the mechanistic, what is the mechanistic basis of bradykinesia? What are the pathophysiological um, uh, mechanisms or, and, and of course, uh, what contributes to bradykinesia? So, first of all, when we talk about the patient moving in the space and doing things, performing his activities, of course, we are talking about, um, uh, there are many contributors, okay? Contributors can be behavioral. Okay, depression, I mean, affective state, apathy may affect his functioning in the world, his movement in the world, fatigue, insomnia, all of these are very common non-motor features that the patients face in daily life. And there are also un other contributors, which are muscle weakness that we can find. Many studies have found muscle weakness in Parkinson's patients. The tremor and the rigidity may affect uh, the bradykinesia as well. And when we talk about the specific findings, physiological findings in bradykinesia, um, uh, we see that there is insufficient recruitment of muscle force during the initiation of movement. And we know that this is associated strongly with the failure of the basal ganglia uh, output to reinforce the cortical mechanisms that prepare and execute the commands to move. Okay, and there is particular difficulty with self-paced movements, okay, as we saw here in the freezing problem. Now, uh, the principle of the, of the deficit, there is insufficient recruitment of muscles during the initiation of movement, and, uh, and while the movements may often be performed with normally timed births, the amount of EMG activity scaled relative to the desired movement is a problem, okay? There are also, we know that there are also sensory scaling problems and sensory, uh, sensory motor integration problems. And uh, we know that the patients can be perform almost normally as guiding them with external cues can really improve uh, the, the, the movement. And we know that there's a problem with the two tasks simultaneously that really slow down uh, the movements. Now, what about the pathophysiology? So, in the Parkinsonian state, there, we know that there, is, uh, there are oscillations in the beta band, which emerge in the output nuclei of the basal ganglia in the Parkinsonian brain. And there, this causes, and it is associated with an, an uh, inact, uh, um, imbalance activation of the direct and the indirect pathways going through the basal ganglia, thalamocortical uh, pathways. And this is probably the basis of the hypokinetic motor condition. And these oscillations are, are abnormally syn synchronized, and there is a lot of experimental evidence that uh, supports that there is a common uh, pathophysiological mechanism of the bradykinesia, hypokinesia, all of the elements of the bradykinesia with the sequence effect, uh, with the sequence effect that involves these beta oscillations in the basal ganglia, which uh, leads to a failure, actually, of the basal ganglia output to the motor cortex, to the primary motor cortex. And, um, and we, we know from several kinds of studies, this is just one of them, that the severity of the bradykinesia complex uh, and we can see it in untreated patients, drug-naive patients even, is really strongly correlated with the, with the, with the dopamine deficit. We can see it in these, uh, in these uh, brain scans that represent the, uh, the integrity of the dopamine uh, nigrostriatal uh, pathways. And we know that the bradykinesia um, is, can be very... Uh, um, uh, robustly affected by dopaminergic uh, replacement therapy. That means the dopamine precursor, which is L-DOPA and dopamine agonists. 
and, and, um, and all of the Parkinsonian syndrome improves. I mean, the, the tremor usually improves, the rigidity, and the bradykinesia improves a lot with dopaminergic therapy. And we can see it in the extreme cases of Parkinson's patients with advanced diseases. I, I think uh, many of you probably have seen in your conferences that patients can move, can, can switch from a completely akinetic condition that they cannot rise, they cannot make one single pace, uh, and they can hardly use their hands or speak to a condition in which they switch to on after one big dose of L-DOPA, and then they, they, they can move around and run or, around the block and, and draw and do amazing things. So the, the, there is a real robust effect of the dopaminergic medications, and, uh, but if we look into the bradykinesia complex, we know that the velocity and the amplitude improve, while the sequence effect of decrement does not improve that well with dopaminergic therapy. That means we cannot really normalize the movement. And we also have, except for oral uh, medications with a dopamine replacement, we also have interventional procedures, deep brain stimulation, for instance, and the subthalamic nucleus deep brain stimulation procedure of introducing an elect electrodes to this structure and a pacemaker really improves all the motor aspects of the Parkinsonian patients. And we can see that even um, the, the basic elements of movements are ameliorated with deep brain stimulation. And this is a study, one of many studies in which they compared the effect of deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus versus therapy, and also the addition of both, and saw how it affects movements. So we can see that there is a very uh, similar effect of medications and of deep, deep brain stimulation on, the, on these elements of movements, increased movement speed, uh, burst duration, uh, and reduction of co-contraction. These are all the explanations of of the improvement of the, of the motor, but we see that it can never be normalized uh, to the normal condition. Still, even in the best condition, uh, with DBS, with medication, and both together, the patients, uh, healthy subjects still have higher, um, uh, higher uh, movement speed, probably due to the limitations in the amplitude and temporal scaling of the agonist antagonist bursting pattern, and we can never really normalize the movement. Okay, so I think we got to the end of the lecture, and what did we learn about slowing a movement in the context of Parkinson's disease? That means bradykinesia, so we're talking about a core motor symptom of Parkinson's, which is associated very closely with disability and reduced quality of life. It's a complex syndrome affecting voluntary and automatic movements in several locations of the body. It's closely associated to a dopaminergic deficit in the striatum because of the neurodegeneration, and it leads to excessive oscillatory activity and decrease of excitation of the primary motor cortex and it is treated luckily for us and for our dear patients effectively by dopamine replacement therapy or by, and or by DBS. Thank you. Um, thank, thanks a lot, Sharon, for the, that's a great talk. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, the reduction um, as a function of time when you said when they do a sequence. What, what causes the, the reset for it to go back again up to the... Um, physiologically, I'm, I'm not sure. But, uh, clinically, is, of course, it's the pause, okay? When we ask the patient to tap his finger and he begins big and after, very, then it goes slower, or sometimes not so slower, but then it really stops. After we stop, we ask him to start it again. We can see that he, he has the, the large amplitude at the beginning. I guess um, some kind of rebooting of the plan, of the program has to do with it. Maybe somebody here will be able to answer this better than I can, but the pathophysiological mechanisms, I'm not exactly sure. I guess it's the replanning of the whole thing. Do you have an idea why? Because you said that the, the dopamine doesn't, doesn't help with this effect, whereas it does with, all the, with most of the other symptoms. Hmm. Um, this has been shown repeatedly, uh, but uh, I think it's, it's, it's still enigmatic, I would say. Yes, 
Bradykinesia uh, exists in, uh, of course, in other basal ganglia disorders. Even Huntington's disease, which is a hyperkinetic disorder, we see that under, below, I mean, below the involuntary excessive movements that the patients have, there is a lot of bradykinesia, okay? They, when they have to execute movements, they have an excessive disturbing movements, but they have also low amplitude uh, movements, and many, they have bradykinesia. Other Parkinsonian syndromes, we have a lot of other conditions causing Parkinsonism. One of them are, uh, some of them are degenerative disorders like progressive nu supranuclear palsy, multiple system atrophy, and more, tauopathies, alpha-synuclinopathies. And then we have conditions in which Parkinsonism is secondary to vascular changes in the brain involving the basal ganglia, medications which either, uh, which, which block the dopamine receptors and thus cause a hypodopaminergic uh, deficit in the basal ganglia. And there are many conditions that cause bradykinesia, yeah. Some of them are treated with, uh, with levodopa? Yes, some of these secondary conditions we can treat, but when, for instance, our dopamine receptors are blocked by medications or are destructed because of vascular changes, the response, there is no response or a very minimal response. Bradykinesia is referred to skeletal muscles, but smooth muscles, which are, of course, autonomic uh, controlled, can you refer to them as bradykinetic as well, or even cardiac muscle? Okay. I, that's I, a I, I never thought about it. It just uh, occurred to me while you were talking now. Okay, so I think the, the, the smooth muscles that are in, in even, I mean, in, in so many uh, systems in the body, they're not associated with the nigrostradal dopamine deficit, but we do have cardiac abnormalities which are associated with autonomic dysfunction and the sympathetic system uh, pathology and others. So we can see that in, uh, we don't, but, but it's not part of the, of the complex. It has to, picture. yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I was thinking about constipation and other systematic problems. So the problem with constipation is a pathology that has to do, there is, there is peripheral pathology in Parkinson's. It's, only, it's not only a central nervous system disorder. We have a degeneration of the, or uh, pathology in the enteric nervous system, and this probably contributes to the constipation. Slowness of the bowel movement, yeah, and poverty of bowel movements. My question is, uh, you showed that uh, the pathophysiology of uh, bradykinesia is mainly, may be related with the alteration in the beta bands in the Bayesian ganglia. I wonder whether is, uh, the cortical control is also involved, it's not only in the Bayesian ganglia, but also in the cortical level. In this hypo, in the hypersynchrony of the, yeah. um, I'm not sure about that. Okay, um, thank, thanks again. Thank you.